Okay, so I am changing things up a little bit. I've been speaking about open fellowship error on Sunday evenings and um, evidences on Sunday mornings, but today I'm going to switch them and, um, you know, see what what comes of that, but uh, in part because I think this one's maybe more appropriate for the morning and the other for the evening. So that's how that is. So we're looking today at open fellowship error in this question. When did the Church of Christ begin? And um, perhaps you think that these things do not relate to one another, but they actually do. In fact, it's the heart of the matter. It's the heart of the matter because really what's happening in the churches with regard to open fellowship is a complete misunderstanding of what the church even is and a complete rejection of any idea that we could understand what the Bible says. And so it reminded me of what Jesus said in Mark 1130 when the uh, I guess the powers that were asked him for authority for what he said. And he said, I'll ask you about authority. Was the baptism of John from heaven or from man? Answer me. It's a good question because the baptism of John was from heaven. But the problem is, that's not what they believed. And yet they were afraid of what the people would say. And this really sums up what's happening today. I think what, well, I know for sure in one case, but I think maybe a lot of people are like him. Certainly the leader of this faction, the leader of this movement, believed that the church was a human organization, a human religion. And I think a lot of Christians, or people that you thought were Christians, think the same thing. So the question really is, is the church of Christ from heaven or from man? Where did this come from? And I'm going to start with the bad things. Because uh, as we've been speaking in uh, the evenings, it's important for people to understand where this came from in, in the current state. I want you to understand what is being said and it's not terribly relevant who said it other than the fact that that means something. He's connected. You can trace this and you can get an historical picture of what's happened. What's important is not so much who said this, but what he said and when he said it and the fact that he continued to teach and to preach and to write and that he continues to influence the churches today. That's the thing. The reason for looking back at this is not that I'm concerned about a deceased person uh, who taught something a long time ago. It's not a straw man kind of argument where you attack somebody who's not here and can't defend himself. This is about the teaching because he put a sword in the hand of the devil. He showed the brotherhood how to make false fellowship with Romans 14. And that's very important. You've got to understand where this came from. And I don't mean where in the sense of, well, Ed Harrell did it and he did it by means of these articles. No, 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 no. I mean where in the sense of, did the church come from heaven or did it come from man? Because that's the central question. Do we understand, can we understand the Bible? They believe you can't. That's the bottom line. So back in 1964, one of the first things that Professor David Edwin Harrell Jr., known to you and me as Ed Harrell, wrote was a piece called The Sectional Origin Origins of the Churches of Christ. Um, and for those of us who are not so into academic language, Sectional means regional with regard to north and south. Mason-Dixon line, um, Civil War, Union and uh, Confederacy. 
So sectional refers to the north and the south division that was in the country. The title, Sectional Origins of the Churches of Christ, means the churches of Christ originated with regional, you know, sectional problems. That's what he believes. This was written in 1964. One of the things, and this is uh, two slides here, the name Disciples of Christ is most useful to describe the entire nebulous movement. The movement remained united until the religious census of 1906 that listed separately the Disciples of Christ and the Churches of Christ. The conservative wing of the divided movement, the Churches of Christ, has grown very rapidly in the half century since 1906. Together with the more liberal segment of the movement, the Christian Church, the Church of Christ forms the largest and most significant Native American religious movement. Oh, someone's at the door. <laughs> Go ahead, Nico. Um, all right, so there's a lot to, to look at here, and I think it's worth looking at it. So again, the name, if you're going to be searching, and, and you may not need to search, I have a lot of material that I have been able to pull down and I'm willing to share. Um, but the name you'd be looking for would be David Edwin Harrell Jr. That's his uh, professor name. But his name as a preacher in the churches was Ed Harrell. Okay. Again, his assertion is that the entire thing that happened in the United States is the disciples of Christ. And it's a nebulous religious movement. But in that movement, there was a split which was recognized in the United States Census of 1906, when David Lipscomb uh, answered the question with Churches of Christ, uh, when the census asked him what, what religion, that's what, that's what he said. And a lot of other places did the same thing, and so this was officially recognized as a separate denomination from Disciples of Christ, Christian Church. Harold says, the conservative wing of the divided movement, the Churches of Christ, has grown rapidly in the half century since 1906. So he's, his assertion is, the church split from the Christian Church. The Church of Christ did. And that it is a conservative wing of the religious movement that is Native American. It is an American religious movement. That's the assertions. And this was 1964. Um... Well, some would say that was a long time ago. Yes, it was a long time ago. I understand that. So we'll, be, we'll keep looking here. But I want you to understand, this is the assertion. And it's, of course, completely backwards. The truth is, Christians were here, as, just like we are today. And some of them decided to loosen authority and go a different route. And that became the Christian Church, Disciples of Christ. Not the other way around. But, notwithstanding, Mr. Harrell con concluded his study with this sentence, the 20th century Churches of Christ are the spirited offspring of the religious rednecks of the post-bellum South. Post-bellum meaning following the Civil War. So the church, in his way of thinking, arose from differences between northern culture and southern culture. And the southerners, the confederacy, the rebels, had a culture all to their own such that it infected their way of thinking about religion. 
and that's where the Churches of Christ came from. They denominated themselves in the United States Census of 1906. Then he says in his footnote, of course the Churches of Christ have not remained an economic and cultural unit since 1906. The movement is once again dividing along sociological lines. That's how he covers the institutional split. <laughs> sociological lines for the institutional split. That's interesting. I don't know what that would be. The first one didn't hold any water, so this one I, I can't explain either. But that's 1964. And some would say, well, that's a long time ago. Yes, I understand. But do you understand that that man is, or was, he's passed away recently, is a teacher, has been a teacher, has been a celebrated teacher, preacher, author, professor in the churches his whole life. And he did not change that position, is what I'm telling you. In 2000, Ed Harrell wrote a book, The Churches of Christ in the 20th Century, Homer Haley's Personal Journey of Faith. And when you are done vomiting in your mouth, we'll continue reading <laughs> from Personal Journey. He says in the preface, Ed Harrell does, theoretically, churches of Christ are an undenominational movement of autonomous local churches. You think it's a movement? Is that what the Bible says? Where are the verses for these things? Have you noticed nary a Bible verse on any of these? Anybody notice yet? In deference to that notion, a quaint little notion, you foolish knaves. <laughs> In deference to that notion, I have avoided using the formal title Churches of Christ and use instead a lowercase c when referring to the thousands of independent congregations that make up the Churches of Christ. So, he gave us a lowercase c to celebrate the theory that we are an undenominational local, autonomous local congregation. <laughs> Actually, though, he says, the churches of Christ sometimes act like a denomination, and church members, called Christians, often think denominationally. The most common euphemism for denomination is brotherhood. Yes, so when you call somebody a Christian because that person has been baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for forgiveness of sins, you're actually just asserting a socio-cultural norm from the religious movement native to North America. That's what he's doing here, you see. And when you talk about the brotherhood, as in your brothers and sisters in Christ Jesus, wherever they may be found in this land or elsewhere, you're actually talking about the human denomination that you have founded in 1906. He said, even in the most structured wings of the movement, churches of Christ emerge as an unruly and petulant denomination. Now, I showered this morning, so I don't know which of you is petulant in here. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I see some hands. I understand. Put, please put them down and don't expose your underarms. But the structured wings of the movement, meaning the Christian church, disciples of Christ, is a part of the movement. The churches of Christ, non-institutional, are a part of the movement. The institutional churches are a part of the movement. What movement? The religious movement. Which one is that? We'll get there. <laughs> that was 2000. How about... 2000 was 20 years ago. How about 2010? You know, he was one of the editors of the magazine Christianity Magazine. And it was a terrible thing. It was a horrible thing where he taught the brethren how to have fellowship with a false use of Romans 14. He and the other editors of that magazine gave an interview at Florida College in 2010, which is available to you on YouTube, although I've actually compiled it and made it easier to understand what they're saying because I'm a nerd and I like audio. 
So if you want it easier to understand and all in one video, I have that if you'd like. But here's what he said in those videos. The series in fellowship that he wrote is something I preached for a good while. Those articles are basically just articles and describe the way the movement has reacted to differences of belief. Again, are we the churches that belong to Christ or are we a movement? Differences of belief. Hmm. Is that the same thing as error? Not in his eyes. He also said, if you're part of a movement that says we believe every person has the right to read the scriptures and determine what they say, and we are bound to do what we believe the scriptures teach, notice that one, <laughs> you live in a wild democracy. We always have, and people have always disagreed. Yes, he thinks it's a wild democracy meaning every individual makes their own law, if you will, if you think that a person must read the scriptures and determine what they say and is bound to do what they say. If that's what you believe, then you live in a wild democracy, according to Ed Harrell. You understand what he's saying? He's saying that's not possible. You can't understand it alike. You can't agree. That's what he's saying. And still part of a movement. <laughs> I don't know what he's talking about. Now, his sectional origins, the first one from 1964 that we looked at, was re-released somewhat recently by Abilene Christian University Press. And this is what they had to say about why they re-released it. Why did they put this book out? Here is why. Harrell carefully demonstrated that, quote, we have developed out of specific historic circumstances. His work challenged a long-held taboo in churches of Christ, admitting that our beliefs and practices had indeed been shaped in many ways by the social, cultural, and economic circumstances of our American context. Its publication in the respected Journal of Southern History, which is jstor.org, served to enhance its credibility and impact. Okay, that's true. Um, that last sentence is. <laughs> Interesting, don't you think? Challenging a long-held taboo in Churches of Christ. We have a taboo. You're not supposed to admit that the teachings that we espouse have actually been shaped by social, cultural, and economic circumstances of the American context. That's taboo. We all know it's true, but you're not supposed to admit it. That's how ACU thinks about this. That's also how Ed Harrell thinks about this. And I dare say, there must be a lot of brethren who think that way. Because this guy got around. He did a lot of teaching, and people loved him. They lapped it up. He knows the truth now, though. The Church of Christ. When did it begin? I have here a table of what the Bible says, and a table, and what Ed Harrell says. It's the Bible versus Ed Harrell. Who are you going to believe? How did the Church of Christ begin? Well, the Bible says Jesus Christ founded the Church of Christ. Ed Harrell says David Lipscomb denominated the Church of Christ in his response to the United States Census in 1906. Which one of them do you think is right? When did the Church of Christ begin? In the Bible, you can read that it is the first Pentecost after the resurrection of Jesus, which is almost certainly A.D. 33. Ed Harrell said it was 1906, the response to the United States Census. Where did the church begin? In the Bible, the people were gathered in Jerusalem in Acts chapter 2. 
on the day of Pentecost when the gates of heaven were opened. And in Harold's writings, it's Native American religious movement. Which of them are you going to believe? Which of these is correct? Now, the thing about this is he's got, you know, he is a, well, he was a professor of history. He's got a lot of research. You, if you look at these works, they're scholarly. They have a great deal of influence, as ACU mentioned. They're on JSTOR.org. It's uh, the Journal of Southern History. It's um, a very well-respected, well-known, well-trod serial among academics. What does, it tell, what does that tell you? Well, it tells you that there's a whole lot of, quote-unquote, proof that this is how it happened. And he was the chief proponent of the idea that this is how it happened and provided you know the writings the history the articles that would support this assertion so when people say this it's necessarily coming from him he's the leading proponent the leading um, scholar in this matter So you got to understand that was 1964 in religious or in a, you know in academic circles. <laughs> who gets the you know who gets the Journal of Southern History religious report? Every Baptist seminary in the South. So when the men you knew, who were faithful gospel preachers, went to the debate podium to deal with the Baptists. Little did they know that the Baptists already had Ed Harrell's writings in hand. They already knew, they thought, where the church really came from. Understand what happened there? We got lied to. We got lied to. They played us. But what else is new? <laughs> The sons of this world are more shrewd in their dealings. I would rather be with God, if naive, than to be with Satan. So what does the Bible say about church origins? Enough of looking at the junk that this guy said. But it's important to open fellowship because he got used a lot. He got celebrated a lot. Uh, I read to you from his book in 2000. I read to you uh, from his video on YouTube, his interview at Florida College in 2010. Do you know where he held a gospel meeting in 2012? Kleinwood, Houston. Of course. Why not? That's the direction they've gone. He does. He did a lot of things like this all over the place. Now, do people know that this is what he teaches? I don't know if they do. But understand, the reason why he argued the way that he did on Romans 14, this is what I'm saying to you. It doesn't matter what Romans 14 says and how you understand it or don't understand it. That's not the issue. The issue is, he thinks it doesn't matter. You can't understand it anyway. That's the problem. This is just a game to him. So, what does the New Testament say about it? Well, in Mark 9, 1, Jesus said, Truly I tell you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God after it has come with power. There could not be a single clearer verse than Mark 9, 1 in this regard. It has everything that you need. First of all, there's people standing here, as in persons who were alive in approximately 30 A.D., to hear Jesus say this at a time when lifespans were eh, maybe about as good as ours are. So somebody who's there listening would be an adult, maybe 20 years old, let's say. Let's say that person could live to 90. Okay, so 70 years. What's that? It's still less than 100 AD, right? Sometime in that first century, while those people were still alive, as he said, some standing here who will not taste death until they first see the kingdom. 
the kingdom can be seen. How after it has come with power, it has already come. See, in the, in the Lord's Prayer, there is thy kingdom come, right? Which was what they were supposed to pray before he came. But it's here now. We don't pray that anymore. It's here. It's a good thing to remember and to rememberize, <laughs> to jog when you are praying, to remind you to pray for the church. <laughs> but the church is already here. The kingdom is here. When did it come? Well, it came within the lifetime of some people standing there listening to Jesus. He said they wouldn't taste death until they have already seen the kingdom of God come with power. It came during the lifetime of those people, and they did not live for 2,000 years and relocate to North America. Okay? Let's just rule that out right now. That is not what happened. Joseph Smith notwithstanding. So, Luke 24, verse 49. I, who? Jesus Christ, the Son of God, I am sending the promise of my Father upon you. But stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. So Jesus is the one who established this thing, according to the Bible. Stay in the city. What city? Jerusalem. They're in Jerusalem. They're staying in Jerusalem until they're clothed with power. What does power mean? Well, it's what Jesus said in Mark 9. The kingdom of God has come with power. In Luke 24, he says, stay into the city until you are clothed with power from on high. So the apostles have to be clothed with power. So we just narrowed it down, right? The 20 year old that we supposed might be listening to Jesus who could possibly live to be, you know, up to like whatever, 100 AD, has just been narrowed down. No, it has to be in the lifetime of the apostles because they're going to be clothed with power. And it's going to be in Jerusalem. After his resurrection in Acts chapter 1, he tells the apostles very plainly, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. So he told them, stay in the city until you're endued with power from on high. Now the Holy Spirit is to come upon you. Is that from on high? Yes. And it is call also called power. And Luke is the author of both Luke 24, 49, you will be clothed with power. And also Acts 1, 8, you will receive power. It's the same incident that he's talking about. And it is the thing that happened in Acts 2, 4. They were all in one place. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them utterance. So they had power from on high, filled with the Holy Spirit, to say the wonderful works of God. And what they said in Acts 2.38 is, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the Holy Spirit's gift. Now, I've highlighted in the name of Jesus Christ here because this is a turning point. Repent. Be baptized every individual in the name of Jesus Christ for forgiveness of sins and receive the Holy Spirit's gift. This is a turning point. From here on out, the church is spoken of as being present. And baptism, the one that counts, is baptism in the name of Jesus Christ. Observe, if you will, Acts 19 when Paul comes to the inland country of Ephesus and he finds people there who had learned as far as the baptism of John, but not the baptism of Jesus, he taught them what Jesus teaches on the matter, saying, John preached that people should believe in the one who was coming after him. That's Jesus, which they knew. They were real disciples. They knew that. They just didn't know the rest of the story. And so when Paul told them the rest of the story in Acts 19.5, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Which is telling us that the baptism of John is good, but it's not all there is. You've got to be baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Despite having been baptized in the name of John, if you will, or with the baptism that John baptized with. 
which was not in his own name, really. In Ephesians 4, in Paul's letter to the church at Ephesus, the people who just obeyed the gospel, <laughs> who had been baptized into John, but now are baptized into Jesus, he wrote, there is one Lord, one faith, one baptism. Which one do you think it is? Is it John's? Obviously not. This was covered in Acts 19. It's the baptism in the name of Jesus Christ. The one that they did when they realized that John pointed to the next one. And what is the baptism of Jesus Christ? Well, in Acts 10, this is clarified for us as well. 47 to 48. When Peter is speaking to Romans, the first Gentiles to hear this, the Holy Spirit of God falls on the Romans the way that it fell on the apostles in Acts 2. And Peter's response at verse 47 is, Can anyone withhold water for baptizing these people who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. So the Spirit fell on them. Is that a Holy Spirit baptism? Probably. I'm not sure what verse to point to and say that yes that's what it is but if you want to say there's such a thing and that that's what it is that's okay it's only happened twice it happened in Acts 2 when the spirit fell on the apostles and it happened in Acts 10 when the spirit fell on the Romans there is no other record of this and what uh, Peter said it, uh, admittedly it's not here it's in chapter 11 but he said that they received the Spirit just as we did at the beginning. So when Peter speaks to the other apostles about this, they speak to it as a singular event, something that happened to them, not to everybody. And it was odd, if you will. God was bearing testimony that the Gentiles were included by allowing the Spirit to fall on these Romans. But even that is not enough to surmount the test of Ephesians 4 and verse 5. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. Which one is it? Is it the Holy Spirit baptism or is it the baptism in the name of Jesus Christ? Well, he commanded them to be named, baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. That's a commandment. The Spirit falling on them was not something that was commanded. It's something that God did, something that happened. Being baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, that's a commandment. Just like we read in Acts 2.38, he commanded them, repent and be baptized every individual in the name of Jesus Christ for forgiveness of sins. Here in Acts 10.48, he commanded them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Which one is that? It is 47. Can anyone withhold water? It's baptism in water. Not because... Not because I said so. Not because the Church of Christ takes that position in support of General Lee or whatever. I don't even know how that makes any sense. <laughs> uh, it's because you can see for yourself there were multiple kinds of baptism, but there's only one that really counts. It's the one that they commanded the people to do in Acts 2.38 and that everybody did from that point forward, and that in Acts 10, superseded, or, in, I'm sorry, in, in um, well, yes, in Acts 10, it superseded the baptism of the Holy Spirit. In Acts 19, it superseded the baptism of John. In Acts 19, that was in Ephesus, and then Ephesians 4, 5 says there's one baptism. We didn't make this up. It's what the Bible teaches about the matter. The church is spoken of as being in existence. The name of Jesus Christ is the name. That's the authority. That's the king. He's the king. That exists. It happened in the lifetime of the people standing there. It happened with the apostles, endued with power from on high in the city of Jerusalem, just like he said it was going to be. We didn't make this up. It's what the Bible says. Despite people's protests that you can't understand it, I think that you can. Those are the verses. It's easy. That's not the issue, is it? 
And that's what I'm trying to say here. That's not the issue. The issue is people don't want to hear it. <laughs> it's not that you can't understand it. It's that you won't. Finally, we look at Jude. Because Jude comes late. Quite late. He's the last one to write, as far as I can tell. And what he writes is nothing new. He just points us back, especially to Second Peter, but points us back to what was written already. Where he says in verse 3, I found it necessary to write, appealing to you to contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. The faith was delivered, says Jude. Now, we've already read enough verses, I think, to prove that this already happened. But Jude is one of the Lord's brothers. So when you talk about somebody's lifetime and the kingdom comes, this man is a brother of Jesus in the flesh. And he says, contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. That's signed, sealed, and delivered, baby. That's over. It's done. In the lifetime of one of his brothers of the flesh, that's the end of that. It's over. There, there's not more revelation. There's not another establishment. My point being, this has nothing to do with America. It has nothing to do with 1906 and David Lipscomb or any other, you know, Confederate soldier or whatever. It's got nothing to do with that. <laughs> we'll talk more about some of these charges at another opportunity. But for today, we're asking, when did the Church of Christ begin? It's important to word it that way. Because if you say, when did Jesus establish his church? Oh, they'll all say, oh yeah, well, you know, AD 33, New Testament, Acts 2, of course. Ed Harold would say that. You have to ask, when did the Church of Christ begin? And they say, oh, well, now, Church of Christ is a denomination, a name that was adopted by David Lipscomb when he responded to the United States Census Bureau in 1906. Right. That's where the problem comes, and that's where you have to realize, hey, no, no, that has nothing to do. <laughs> I mean, maybe that happened. Maybe demonstrably there is some guy with that name, and he filled in that name, and, and that may all be historical fact, but what does that have to do with the Bible? What, what does that have to do with the truth? Haven't we been warned that Satan arrays himself as an angel of light? <laughs> of course, they make it look like the church. And they, of course, they name it like the church, and they worship like the church for the most part. Of course, it wouldn't be effective if they didn't do that. In Jude 17, But you, brothers, must remember the, the predictions of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. So, the inspired writings of the apostles is what we must hold on to. He said the faith is once and for all delivered. And our charge is to remember what the apostles spoke about. That was future. The apostles being dead is kind of what he's getting at. Paul's gone. Peter's gone. John went to exile on the Isle of Patmos. He couldn't have lived more than a few weeks. If there was fresh water on the island, and I'm not sure there was. You must remember the predictions of the apostles. I like Jude because he's kind of like us. He's the normal guy. <laughs> Just all he does is point back to the Bible. But it's very important to have this letter from him because it's showing this is what we do now. There is not, there are not more dreams, there are not more revelations, there's not more activity happening in the church that belongs to the Lord. We are to remember the predictions of the apostles. We are to contend, as he says, fight, wrestle for the faith of once for all delivered to the saints. Once and for all. That's it. That's all there is to this. Um, all right. So, this is what we're called to. And I, again, I think it is important. 
for us to recognize there's a great deal of falsehood in the assertion that the churches came from a human religion an American movement and that it has a tremendous amount of influence in the churches today his teaching went everywhere and people used him everywhere it is highly influential and we'll talk more about that but that's why this is an open fellowship lesson because that open fellowship error really does have at its center this man's writings now admittedly this man said he was just cataloging what existed just describing what was already there and how people did things and I think that's probably true actually that's probably true but he nonetheless did codify that and publish that and put a name to that and hand it to the enemy so there has to be some accountability but the name is useful mostly for tracing the lineage of that doctrine where did it go and whom did it influence uh, we have a lot more to talk about but I'll tell you uh, he appeared in Florida College lectures often he did many many gospel meetings all over the country um, his articles on Romans 14 called the bounds of Christian unity um, were a tremendously influential work in how churches practice uh, or actually fail to practice discipline and <laughs> um, how the churches exercised the the uh, fellowship that they did and yeah homer haley's kind of incidental i think um he's a good example of somebody who taught error and was nonetheless fellowshipped and the number one champion of that was ed harrell no question the way in which they did that was by applying the things that he wrote about romans 14. and it became the measuring stick it became the rule the manual for how to do this and it's how they're operating today that's why we're looking at this and i'll tell you we, we have more to do but that's why we're looking at it it's not about this man or at or uh, homer haley or anything it's about the fact that he came up with a method and that method is widely adopted and currently in practice by the overwhelming majority of non-institutional churches that is a fact and it comes back to the same thing when did the church begin is really a question of can we all understand the bible alike his belief is no you can't and uh, he holds us in derision frankly uh, we'll look, i'll show you some of those quotes later but he said yeah these people sincerely believe that they can approach any question with a cool-headed objectivity from the bible well, uh, yeah, yeah, you can. <laughs> I have no problem with that. He's got a problem with that. He mocked a Texas preacher who said our only hope for unity was to believe that every word of the Bible is inspired and that we must understand them. He mocked that, Ed Harold did. But no, that's correct. That's completely correct. It is the only hope of spiritual unity. But what I'm saying to you all is, most of the churches do not accept that anymore. That's what you think of as, well, that's the Church of Christ. That's the classic church. Yeah, I understand. But most of them don't do that anymore. They don't believe you can understand this thing. And in large part, it does have to do with the teachings and the influence of Ed Harrell. I won't lay everything at his feet, but he codified it. He made it cool. He made it smart. For what it's worth not very much when you leave this world well you saw in the new testament the plea of god for you to repent and to make things right with him by being buried in baptism for forgiveness of sins and we will help you to do that today because this really is the church that belongs to jesus this really is the thing that started way back when 
If today we can help you to obey the gospel, we're glad to help you. If you need our prayers as a Christian, we're glad to pray with you that you can be strong in the faith. If you need our prayers or if you need to be baptized, either way, please let the need be known now by coming to the front while we stand and sing the song selected.